Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope you're having a good time today. Yeah? I've, I'm completely floored and in, inspired by hearing Helen and Tim, actually, so I don't even know if I can talk to you anymore. But I'm just going to adjust my little jelly baby bridge here, and I can assure you that there were many jelly babies harmed during the production of this bridge. There you go. So I am going to talk to you about three bridges today. Okay, tell you a little bit about myself to start off with. So that was me um, a few years ago. I'm not going to tell you how many years ago. And people might look at these pictures and think, well, she was born to be an engineer. She's wearing her engineer dad's suit, and she's making a helicopter and wants to kind of fly it off. But the truth is, I had no idea what I wanted to do with myself until I was about 20. So I knew I loved maths and science. I was pretty good at physics, so I studied physics at Oxford. I did a degree in physics, and it was sort of partway through that degree that I did some work experience. And my placement really wasn't very interesting. I was walking around the physics department of my university, counting where all the smoke alarms were and the extinguishers were, and putting them on a drawing. But the guys around me were engineers, and they were designing um, the equipment that is now in CERN, which is where the particle um, accelerator is, and they've just recently discovered the Higgs boson. And I just thought, that's amazing. I love physics and maths. I love designing stuff. I love making stuff. So you put them together, you get engineering. And that's what I decided to do. So I did a master's in structural engineering after my degree. So how many of you have heard of structural engineering or have ever met a structural engineer or know what it's about? Can I just have a show of hands? Yeah, there's a few, quite a few people. I usually get about one or two hands, so well done, guys. And in very simple terms, my job is to make sure that buildings and bridges stand up. Okay, so a bit of responsibility there for me, but it's great fun. So just this is these are three projects that I've worked on, and I've picked quite different ones. So I've got the shard on the left-hand side, which is the tallest building in Western Europe. I designed the foundations of that building, so that's what holds the entire building up. And don't worry, it's been checked by my boss. <laughs> and I've also designed the very top of the building, which is called the spire. So if any of you have been up to the viewing gallery, and instead of looking at the views, you know, it's London, it's boring, whatever, instead of that, look at the steel. Look up towards the sky, and you'll see some amazing, fantastic steel there. And that's what I designed. I'm very, very proud of that. On the other side of the screen, on the right, is a thing called Hairy Wood, which was a little sculpture I helped to design for Covent Garden. And I put that up there because I think we forget that even sculptures need some input from a structural engineer, because people were climbing up into that sculpture. It was sitting there in the middle of Covent Garden. And the last thing you want is for that to tip over on someone. So I had a bit of input on that as well. And the middle bridge is bridge number one for today. It's called the Northumbria University Bridge. Um, we had an old bit of the university campus on the left side. There was a new building being built on the right side, and there was no way for the poor students to basically cross between the two bits of campus. So we put a bridge in. So the first day I went into my job, I was 22 years old, I'd just done my master's, and I was given this diagram that my boss drew, and he said, we've got this bridge we need to design. So we've got a motorway on one side, we've got a railway on the other side, we've got a little bit of um, headroom that we have to maintain so the cars can pass underneath it, we've got a bit of existing wall that we might use as foundations. So he gave me a whole set of challenges or problems or constraints, and said, well, how are we going to build a bridge within those constraints. And there's probably 10 or 15 or 50 different types of bridges you could put together with those parameters. But we chose this one because this is the one that suited it best. So engineering is all about understanding what the challenges are, understanding what we want to do, and then using a bit of creativity to put a bridge together. It's pretty exciting stuff. So that's the sort of big scale of what you do, well, how are you going to fit this bridge into this space? And then this is the very top of the bridge, the top of the big pylon. Um, and what you see here is where all the different cables come in. 
So as a structural engineer, it's also my job to look at the small stuff. How are we going to connect all of those cables up onto that column? How are we going to make sure that all the forces are going in the right direction, that the steel is not going to bend over or anything like that? So we have to make sure that it's all strong enough. We also have to think about, well, how are we going to build it? And I am a little bit obsessed with cranes, I have to say. I do like, do like a crane. And so we did these sketches to show how we might actually build it. So are we going to put a crane in the motorway? We're going to stop the traffic? Or we're going to have to tell the train guys that they can't drive their trains for a few days? So we come up with different ideas, again, using these kind of parameters or constraints and decide, well, this is how we can build it. So it's very, very exciting. It's very, very creative because, you know, I always get bored of people telling me engineering and physics, they're not creative. Of course they're creative, because we have to come up with new ways of solving problems. We have to imagine solutions that didn't exist before and come up with something brand new, and I think that that's really good fun. So, and of course, I mean, my favorite part of the project is when it actually gets built. So, you know, there's the real crane, and there's the bridge going up, and on the right you can see that, you know, the sketch that we've done, that's the actual real steel. And, and for me, when I see that kind of thing, I just think, wow, that's a lot bigger than I expected it to be. Pretty exciting. And that's what it looks like now. And I'm very pleased to say it's been standing safe for eight years. So bridge number two for today is the Brooklyn Bridge, which is in New York. It connects two islands up. It connects Manhattan to Brooklyn. And this is going back um, to the 1800s. The last time I did this talk for some young students, they thought that I'd been involved in this bridge. <laughs> I am not that old. Thank you very much. Um, but there you go. So the Brooklyn Bridge is a beautiful, beautiful bridge in New York. And the reason I've put this up today is because of this lady in the picture. She's called Emily Roebling. And she is the daughter-in-law and, and the wife. There was a father and son team of engineers that designed this bridge. And then there was a bit of a tragedy on site. So her father-in-law died in an accident on site. And about seven or eight months later, her husband had an accident on site and he was very severely paralyzed from this incident. So all this work that this family had done to put this bridge together was going to be in vain. And this bridge was a really, really exciting bridge because it was the longest bridge of its time. It was the first bridge when they used steel instead of iron. And it was also the first bridge where they actually built the foundations underwater using this new technique, which unfortunately is where her husband actually had the accident. So, you know, it's, it's not any, any little bridge. It was the biggest bridge in the world. So Emily Roebling thought to herself, oh, well, you know, I know a little bit of science and maths. Why don't I take some notes from my husband and we'll, we'll see whether I can answer the guy's questions on site. And this was at a time, okay, in the 1800s, well, men believed that women's brains weren't capable of understanding that sort of thing. And obviously that's not true. So she was a real pioneer of her time. But the reason I admire her the most is not because of all the technical maths and physics and engineering that she studied, because that's all important. It was the other thing. It was her communication, the relationships she had with people. Because engineers don't just sit behind their computers, you know, hiding away um, all day. I have to talk to people all the time. So she was talking to the builders on site. She was telling them, well, this is how you're going to build it. If this is a problem, this is how you're going to solve it. She was also talking to the politicians and the people that were funding the bridge, convincing them that she was the right person to help push this project through and get it delivered on time and on budget. So she brought forward this whole different aspect of engineering, which is talking to people. So she's a really amazing woman, and I've actually written a chapter about her for an ebook, which is going to be released next year, so I can tell you where the website is. It's for the Ada Lovelace Stay book. So there's a big, lovely story about her um, in that book. So bridge number three is the Jelly Baby Bridge, which you can see behind me. And what I want to talk about briefly is resonance. So how many of you know what resonance is or have heard of it? I've got a few. So I'm going to have a go at trying to explain it to you. So when you're sitting on a swing and you're given a big push, you oscillate. And you oscillate at a particular speed and frequency. If you then get pushed at the same frequency as you're oscillating, you go higher and higher. 
So resonance is about having big movement in a kind of vibrating or oscillating way. Now, every single structure and object and thing in the world has its own natural frequency. So sometimes if you're in a bus or in a car and you can hear something kind of vibrating when the car is stationary, then that's because it's vibrating at its natural frequency and it's getting quite big and loud and that's what's happening. And the funny thing is that bridges and buildings also have natural frequencies. So another bit of my job is to make sure that that sort of wobbly thing doesn't happen. So many of you might be too young to remember the wobbly bridge in London, but in 2000, in the millennium when this bridge opened, it was all very wobbly. What it was doing was going from side to side like that. Okay, you can also get bridges resonating up and down. So if you walk on a bridge and it feels a little bit bouncy, it kind of goes up and down. But a rather exciting one is when the bridge actually twists. So you get these, ooh, jelly baby aboard. Um, you get these rather amazing sort of wave-like shapes in bridges, which can be caused purely by wind. And here is a video of a real bridge doing what I can make this jelly baby bridge do here. So this bridge was built in, in about the 1940s. This is in the US. And, and that is a bridge made of steel and concrete. Now, my Jelly Baby bridge is nice and flexible, so I could do this all day and nothing's going to happen to it. Total collapse happens to this bridge, however. And um, clearly, it doesn't exist anymore. So hopefully, that's not going to happen to my bridge in Newcastle. Um, I'm sure it won't. It hasn't happened yet. But, you know, here, I mean, this is another thing that we as engineers, as structural engineers, look like. I think the thing to remember is I'm talking about a tiny little portion of engineering today. There's a huge range of different types of engineering you can do. So just to finish up, hopefully I've shown you some examples about engineering being really creative, about solving problems, about having imagination to do things that don't exist already. I've hopefully showed you it's about people as well. You have to work with lots of different people to build things. But also, it's the most rewarding profession. So I'm walking around London, and I often see the shard kind of just pop up. You know, it's pretty tall. You can see it from lots of bits of London. And honestly, it makes me so proud and so happy to know that I played a part in the design of that building. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, I mean, I, I, I'm interested, what do people get wrong about engineering? You know, you talked a little bit about that, but hmm. people probably don't realize that you're stopping all our bridges from telling us jelly babies. <laughs> uh, so, so, so talk, talk to me a little bit about what people get wrong about engineers. I think, um, especially in countries, like, you know, developed countries, so in the West, we take engineering for granted. So our trains work pretty well most of the time. Um, we have great cars, our roads are great, we've got heating, we've got water, our power doesn't cut out. So we forget how important engineering is to literally every single part of our everyday life. So we start to take it for granted, we forget that it's important, and then we don't aspire to, to be part of that amazing world. That was uh, amazing. I'm sure we've got some aspiring engineers in the audience now. Thank you so. very much. Thank you.